Good evening. My name is Shelley Sweeney, and I'm the head of the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections. The University of Manitoba is located on the original lands of the uh, Anishinaabeg, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. On behalf of the University of Manitoba Archives and Special Collections, the Slavic collection of the Elizabeth Davro Library, the Department of German and Slavic Studies, and the members of the J.B. Rudnitsky Distinguished Lecture Organizing Committee. I'd like to uh, welcome each of you to the 25th annual J.B. Rudnitsky Distinguished Lecture with our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Andreas Umland. The funding of this lecture is made possible through the generosity of the J.B. Rudnitsky Endowment, which in, what, in which, sorry, one of the terms of the agreement is that an annual lecture be held that will bring to Winnipeg an internationally acknowledged scholar to speak on a topic of interest in Slavic and or East European studies. The endowment was established in 1992 by Dr. Yaroslav Rudnitsky, who in 1949 was appointed the first head of the University of Manitoba's newly created Department of Slavic Studies, a position he held until his retirement in 1977. In 1994, the annual J.B. Rudnitsky Distinguished Lecture Series was launched. Since then, the lecture series has brought several noted speakers, among them, Christian Friedland, a former deputy editor of the Financial Times and current Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs, noted Canadian journalist Victor Malarek, and prominent author and historian Timothy Snyder. <laughs> And now to introduce this year's guest lecture is Dr. Maroslav Shkandri from the Department of German and Slavic Studies and a member of the J.B. Rudnitsky Distinguished Lecture Committee. Good evening and welcome. Um, Andreas Umland has degrees from Oxford and MPhil from uh, the Free University of Berlin, a Doctor of Philosophy, or is it Philology? D is it is Doctor of Phil, yeah. a PhD from Cambridge, and he has held fellowships or lectureships at Stanford University, Harvard University, the University of Oxford, Ural State University, the Shevchenko University in Kiev, the Catholic University of Eichstätt, and the Kiev Mohila Academy. Since 2014, he has been Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation in Kiev. He's a participant of the Valdai Discussion Group, which is a website, you can visit the website, and on this, this portal, this website, he posts articles dealing with Russian nationalism, the prospects of the Ukrainian language, relations between the European Union, Russia, and Ukraine. Andreas is also a member of the Academic Advisory Council of the European Integration Committee of the Ukrainian Parliament. And he is probably most widely known, I think, for his editing of a web journal uh, a Russian language web journal called Forum Novejshi Vastochno Evropejske Istori i Kulture, a forum for newest, uh, uh, new Eastern European history and culture. This Russian language publication has existed since 2004, but it's also related to a, a, a German language public publication with a similar name, uh, which has existed since 1997. So he's been uh, very influential in uh, uh, explaining Eastern Europe to German language, English language, and Russian language publics. These two journals, these two forums, are uh, related to a program in the Institute for Central and East European Studies at the Catholic University of Einstadt. Um, and they're interdisciplinary, they connect uh, different disciplines and they can they, they bring together different discussion groups. Andreas is also the general editor of a book series 
uh, called Soviet and Post-Soviet Politics and Society, founded in 2004. It makes available affordable scholarly studies in English, German, and Russian to the academic and the general public. These studies deal with recent history and current events, current affairs in what was once the Soviet bloc. It publishes about 15 to 20 volumes per year and focuses on problems dealing with the transition to democracy, the economy, identity formation, civil society, and constitutional reform. There have been recent issues um, on right-wing nationalism in Russia. Um, he's working on one now on Ukrainian nationalism, religious life, higher education, and the protection of human rights. You may be aware of two titles recently published, one edited by Olga Bertelson called Revolution and War in Contemporary Ukraine, and another one edited by David Marples on, the, on Ukraine's Euromaidan. You can find information about these on the website, and it's an easy one, it's a short one, ibidem.eu, ibidem, I-B-I-D-E-M dot E-U. Our speaker maintains a very strong web presence, as you will discover if you Google his name. Uh, I did recently. He has over 8,000 followers and half a million views on Facebook. He's become an important source of information, particularly on developments in Ukraine. As a result, his Facebook account recently was shut down for a while when pro-Putin activists made an attempt to, to, to discredit him. It was soon re reinstated following an energetic international campaign by scholars and opinion makers. Andreas has been extremely open and generous in sharing information as widely as possible. Um, if you Google his name, you'll find his dissertations online, in particular his uh, PhD from the University of Cambridge, which is post-Soviet uncivil society and the rise of Alexander Dugin, and his uh, de dear Phil, <laughs> doctorate in philology, uh, or maybe it's philosophy, is it? Doctor of philosophy. Uh, Free University of Berlin, 1997. On that one, that one is on Vladimir Zhirinovsky in Russian politics. On the site, he also puts up various, numerous books and articles. So, is an excellent source of information. Without a doubt, uh, he is one of the most influential, productive, and respected commentators on con current events in Eastern Europe, particularly on Ukraine and Russia. In fact, he's a model in our digital age for scholars who wish to be public intellectuals. We're delighted that he has accepted our invitation to come to Winnipeg and give the annual J.B. Rudnitsky lecture. And in the spirit of collegiality that he himself has demonstrated in his work, we are pleased to be able to share him with members of other universities. He's already spoken at Harvard University and will continue his tour through Canada with visits to the University of Alberta and the University of Toronto. Please give him a warm welcome. I've just went before giving the lecture here through the list of the previous lectures and um, I was a little bit scared actually by the um, caliber of the previous uh, speakers uh, in this lecture series. and. Um, um, I was thinking maybe I should make a little bit of an introduction because this is a, is a lecture that is um, not exactly an, um, an academic um, uh, research paper uh, as maybe the other lectures uh, or some of the other lectures here were, uh, but rather a somewhat untypical combination of observations on rather different topics which are not unified by a particular research question or a research metho methodology, but actually by a political aim. Uh, and uh, sort of, uh, they, they, they make sense within a, a particular policy that one would develop. And um, uh, so maybe, maybe I give you first um, a short summary, which m may open more questions to you 
then, uh, then give you answers. And then I will, I will, I will uh, sh try to show you why these, why these uh, questions um, are important and why uh, this whole argument is, is important and if I, w I would even think critical for the future of Ukraine. So, um, uh, just to summarize first what, I what I'm going to speak about. Ukrainian critique of Western readiness for an accommodation with Putin's Russia tend to assert Ukraine's national interest, use ethical terminology, or and paint a Russian-Ukrainian conflict in Manichaean terms. While such approaches are understandable, arguments rejecting a grand bargain between the West and the Kremlin can also be formulated from a more distanced perspective. Uh, my paper attacks a particular German plan for a so-called plural peace, peace, and I will explain what I mean by plural here with Russia, to demonstrate four lines of a rebuttal against a proposed Western offer to permanently exclude Ukraine from the EU and NATO. Uh, the paper will detail the damage that an accommodation with Russia um, at the expense of Ukraine would do to such institutions as the EU and NATO, the history of Ukraine striving for EU membership, the regional experience of previous agreements with Russia concerning the post-Soviet territorial issues, and the implications of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict for the worldwide nuclear non-proliferation regime. This now probably sounds pretty confusing to you, I, or I, it's my suspicion, because it's a lot of topics that uh, may not uh, be connected uh, uh, if, if I list them like, like I just uh, did. Um, but what I want to do with uh, sort of compiling these different themes in, in, in one argument here is um, respond to, um, I think, a, a continuing discourse that we will probably observe for as long as Putin remains in power, namely the search for some sort of solution of, uh, for the current tensions between Russia and the West. I wrote this paper, the first draft of it, in 2017 when I think this, this theme was actually more salient than today. I think it has, in a very strange way, become less salient because, as I ex at least feel it, and I, I've, I'm, I'm struggling to formulate this in a, in a sort of academically um, acceptable way, the current tensions between the US and Russia that have been increasing in the last month, I would say, by the week, because all of the new information of Russian intervention in U.S. politics, these tensions are in fact to the benefit, I suspect, of Ukraine because they, they have refocused the public attention of the U.S. again on Eastern Europe and while Ukraine itself plays not always a major role in these U.S. discussions about Eastern Europe, mainly the discussions are about Russia and its agents or supposed agents, agents in, in, uh, in the US, still the, the, uh, the focusing, the recent focusing of the entire US public, not just of academia and dipl diplomats and politicians and journalists on Russia is I suspect, and I'm, I'm saying this is just a feeling, a hunch I have, and I cannot formulate that academically so far, are to the benefit of Ukraine, and they make, in a way, my paper here less salient. The whole sort of the, the, um, the attack that I'm going to present here on this idea of a grand bargain of a sort of peace between the West and, and the Kremlin. Nevertheless, I think the, the tensions will remain between Russia and the West, and the, the stakes will will remain as high as they are now because of, of the sort of the apocalyptic vision of a World War III, of a nuclear World War III. And therefore, I think we will be observing at least as long as the current regime in Russia is in place, we will be constantly observing calls for some sort of accommodation, some sort of condominium with, uh, with the West. And um, 
And what I've been observing in Ukraine a lot is that there are arguments against that. But the arguments that I often hear from, from Ukrainians, whether in, the, in, in Ukraine or in the West, they, to my understanding, at least from the German context, from the German perspective, and in a way, I'm here, I'm here talking from a, Ukrainian pers from a Ukrainian view, but I'm, I'm approaching the, the issue of how to deal with this proposal of a grand bargain between Russia and the West, rather from a sort of Western perspective, or I'm trying to sort of think how people in the West who have no biographical or academic or emotional or whatever affiliation with Ukraine would think about the idea of a grand bargain between uh, Russia and the West. And what I'm also trying to do here is not so much answer the question which is very popular in Ukraine and I suppose here as well about all the private interests and all the ideological engagement that you have among the so-called Putin versteher, the Putin understanders. Yeah? So that you have these, ob these ob very obvious figures like Gerhard Schröder, former Bundeskanzler from the Social Democratic Party, who is now um, uh, an employee of Gazprom and Rosneft who of course argues for all this, you know, that the West has to find some sort of accommodation with. And you have also ideo ideologically engaged people who for whatever reasons, whether they come from the left or the, for the right, they, will, they have these, these ideas. But the appeal that one can only make is not to these sort of subjective motivations. I think that is, that is in a way senseless. You cannot, uh, you know, I've given up to, to, to arguing with, uh, you know, I, I had some attempts to argue with, at least with left-wing people about this, this idea of these, uh, who are Putin versteher. But um, the attempt that I'm making here is that I'm trying to develop uh, four particular arguments that I would think are objective, and I've, I've named them already in the, in the short uh, introduction, that, that would be accepted by a wider pu public, but may still be far too little for, uh, for people who have some sort of private or ideological interest in, a, in an accommodation between Russia and, um, uh, and the West. So how should analysts interested in the future fate of the Ukrainian state react to continuing calls in many Western capitals for some sort of condominium or accommodation with Russia and for grand bargain um, of the West with Moscow. Many Ukrainian commentators react to such proposals with arguments that either appeal to moral principles and ethical rules or that paint a Manichaean picture of a Russian-Ukrainian conflict. The ethical approach appeals to such foundational principles of the world's liberal order of states as the political sovereignty of not only large and powerful nations, but also smaller and weaker nations. The protection of the territorial integrity of states, the freedom of each country to self-determine its foreign policies and entry into international alliances, or quite simply, the elementary right of political nations to live independently, peacefully, and secure. At least as long as their governments do not commit grave mass crimes like genocide, war, or ethnic cleansing. Many Ukrainians' interpretation of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict goes a, even a step further and portrays their confrontation with Moscow as a Manichaean, as I already said, battle between the good and evil, or even as a Ukraine's defense of European civilization against Eastern barbarism. Pro proceeding from their own highly pessimistic view of Russia's imperial history, culture, expansionist intentions, and subversive actions, pro-Western, patriotic Ukrainians call upon Western nations to support them in their epic fight for Europe's future, enlightenment or, and, or and Christian principles, and the liberal international order. Numerous recent revelations of secret Russian meddling in the domestic affairs of various Western nations, above all of the US, have during the last four years, and especially during the last months, rendered this view 
of Moscow, the Ukrainian uh, very negative view of Moscow's motives and geopolitics more plausible than before. Nevertheless, there remains an array of Western diplomats, politicians and analysts who continue to see the achievement of some at least partial mutual understanding with Moscow over the post-Cold War international order in general and Eastern Europe in particular as important, necessary and possible. The strongest, strongest and frequently used argument is that however valuable such liberal achievements as freedom, independence, sovereignty and the rule of law may be, securing peace is more important than all of these noble principles taken together. Moreover, one could argue from a very sort of abstract point of view, in a certain sense, Ukraine is the country that should be first and foremost interested in a peace treaty that provi would provide it with a modicum of security, stability, and predictability. In a working paper of the Hesse uh, Foundation for Peace and Conflict Studies, Hessische Stiftung für, Konflikt, für Friedens- und Konfliktforschung, and in an article for the reputed German um, journal Osteuropa, Eastern Europe, the two prominent German political scientists, Matthias Dembinski and Hans-Joachim Spanger, have discussed various reasons, conditions, and ways for achieving what they call a plural peace in Eastern Europe. And I will explain what is meant by plural here. And I'm taking this here because this is, to my knowledge at least, the most explicit and far-reaching and elaborate outline of such a deal with Moscow. And it is also um, an, a proposal that has been already in Germany quite intensely discussed in, in, uh, and attacked and with a, with a reply by these two authors. And that's why I'm, 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 I'm taking this particular proposal here just as a sort of, as a case study. There are many other such similar proposals. In, in North America, maybe Henry Kissinger has been the, the most prominent, prominent who has indicated something similar, but has not formulated it, as, at least to my knowledge, in such an elaborate way. These two German political scientists, Matthias Dembinski and Hans-Joachim Spanger, juxtapose their concept of a plural peace to that of a liberal peace. A liberal peace with Russia would imply an, an arrangement based on the foundational principles, on the foundational principles for the, an international order derived from the, from the idea of human rights. That means the independence of nations, the rule of international law, and the political sovereignty of states. That would be a liberal peace. A plural peace, in contrast, does explicitly acknowledge that uh, such a peace could be achieved um, not only by observing these liberal princi principles, but, but that achieving a, 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 a sustainable peace would actually mean that also other realities of the current international order, above all the ideas of sphere, spheres of influence, and of unequal political power should be acknowledged. So plural means here simply that it's not about the liberal order with a right to, to self-determination, political sovereignty, rule of international law, but there are also other principles that guide international relations and, uh, and, and that's why it's plural, they are, they are different of them. And, and this would be the way to go for the West to achieve a peace because you cannot achieve with Russia a liberal peace because Russia will not accept these foundational principle, principles of a liberal international order. The basic justification and idea of this approach is those, that peace is by itself so, so valuable that making it sustainable is in view of the enormous price of war worth, worth almost any costs and also throwing away 
parts of the liberal principles uh, of international order. Quite explicitly, Dembinsky and Spanger, these two German authors, lose claim on the uh, claim that they are approaching the solution of the problem of the tensions with Russia under pragmatic viewpoints, with what they call about themselves anticipatory wisdom, vorausschauende Klugheit in German, and less from a moralistic pers perspective. Yet, as I will argue in this uh, paper, in spite of their loudly announced pragmatism and repeated advice to ag act wisely, klug, Dembinski's and Spanger's outline to reach peace in Europe looks altogether incomplete, is partly misleading, and is also occasionally even unrealistic. I will he concentrate here uh, mainly on those three aspects of their proposal, and I will, I will tell you uh, briefly, it's a very easy proposal that they make, a very simple proposal. These, uh, those three aspects of this proposal that concern Ukraine in one way or another, namely the, the issue of Ukraine's national interests, regional experience, and the significance of Ukrainian territorial integrity for world security. I will, like, uh, I will uh, unlike many Ukrainian critics of such an uh, approach, try to uh, leave aside as much as possible, like, like the two German authors, moral issues. And I will focus here on the practical challenges, hindrances, and costs of implementing this German plan for a plural peace. Dembinski's and Spanger's proposal, and this is very similar to others, other proposals that have been made in North America uh, as well, is to codify a permanent exclusion of Ukraine from the EU, uh, from EU and NATO membership. And this would then be a part of a larger deal between Russia and the West, and that is, so to say, within this deal, the West's offer to Russia to exclude permanently Ukraine from the U European Union and NATO. That's the offer that they make. And this is in so far, I think, in a very sort of um, abstract or um, um, uh, pragmatic, uh, from a very pragmatic perspective, a valuable idea as this combination of these two ideas, excluding from the EU and from NATO, might indeed, if, if the West would deed it, make it to Russia, be so powerful, because it would be quite a large proposal, that it could perhaps Moscow persuade to accept such a proposal. Other authors have been either more restrained in their offer, in their offers, other authors I mean who have also made this sort of, uh, uh, or who have proposed ideas of a deal between Russia and the West. They have been not as, as, as generous, so to say, um, to, to Moscow, for instance, by only offering the exclusion of, of Ukraine from one of these two organizations, or they have been in their writings about some grand bargain between Russia and the West simply unclear about what the West would actually offer Putin's regime and what kind of offer then Putin may actually would, would hypothetically perhaps accept. While the offer of Dimbinsky and Spanger is thus, I think, large enough to be considered seriously, it is, I think, difficult to implement in a number of ways. So my critique that I'm going to make here is not that it is um, an immoral offer or that it is uh, sort of uh, uh, unethical, but rather that it is simply difficult to implement. And I'm following here the lead of these two German authors who say that they don't want to talk about moral principles on the liberal peace. They want to talk about how we can get to peace. And they are re ready to, to, to sacrifice some, some liberal principles uh, for, the, for this purpose. Um, Although they, they themselves, I think they are not, they are not uh, Russian agents that I have to, 
one has to say that explicitly. They are not paid by, or not at least as I, and I don't think I know them, at least one of them I, I know personally. These are not, uh, these are not sort of uh, <laughs> employees of Gazprom or, or something like that. These are also not, I would say, ideo ideologically engaged Putin versteher, uh, Putin understanders. They are very critical of Russia. But the argument, as I've already indicated here, is that peace is just so important that you have to achieve it. And if it is not a liberal peace, then a plural peace will be better than the current sort of cold war on the brink of a, um, of a, of a hot war. But, uh, as I will argue here, it is impossible to achieve. And the first and most, uh, most obvious one is perhaps that it would mean that both of the organizations that would exclude Ukraine explicitly from membership, the EU and NATO, would have to discard in one way or another some of their official documents. For instance, the EU has Article 49 in the Treaty on European Union that explicitly allows each European country to apply for membership. And that would have to be somehow this article, which is an important article of the uh, uh, Treaty on European Union, would have to be uh, devalued. Or, uh, in its 2008 Bucharest Declaration, NATO has announced that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of the alliance, although it did not say how and when this would have happen, will happen. And if the EU and NATO would now say that Ukraine will not become a member of the, EU, um, uh, of the EU and NATO, these two organizations would have to publicly denounce, significantly change, or quietly abandon two of their official, major official documents. How exactly this can be done without doing lasting damage to the identity and coherence of these two organizations remains unclear. And this challenging issue has, um, uh, is not even mentioned in Dembinsky's and Spanger's um, proposal. Equally nebulous um, is secondly how the German political scientist proposal can, especially with regard to a permanent exclusion of Ukraine from the EU, be reconciled with some basic features of Ukrainian history, geography, culture, politics, and society. Ukraine's territory lies fully within Europe and its four major churches are Christian, with two of them subordinate to the Vatican. There's a plethora of other close historical and cultural links between various East and West European members of the EU, including Germany on the one side, and Ukraine on the other side. These connections, like for instance the adoption of the Magdeburg Law by a number of Ukrainian cities, including Kiev during the 14th to 17th centuries, play today a considerable role for the self-definition of many Ukrainian people, regions, localities, institutions, and organizations. As a result, Kiev has been constantly asking Brussels for an EU membership perspective for a quarter, quarter of a century now. now. Already on 25th of December 1990, when the USSR still existed, the Ukrainian parliament, the Verkhovna Rada, of the still then Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, quote, resolved that the Council of Ministers of the Ukrainian SSR shall apply its efforts to ensure direct participation of the Ukrainian SSR, the still Soviet Socialist Republic, in the general Euro European process and European structures, end of quote. All Ukrainian parliaments, governments, and presidents, including Viktor Yanukovych, have since outspokenly and unwaveringly supported Ukraine's aim of entering the European communities or European Union as a full member. Since 1998, accessing the EU has been a, if not the, official foreign policy goal of Kiev. In June 2003, under the supposedly pro-Russian President Leonid Kuchma and Prime Minister Viktor Yanukovych, accession to NATO was added to Ukraine's major official international goals in the law on national security fundamentals. 
in 2008 under the pro-Western President Viktor Yushchenko and Prime Minister uh, Yulia Tymoshenko. Ukraine applied together with Georgia unsuccessfully for NATO membership, which then led to the already mentioned uh, 2008 Bucharest uh, declaration of NATO, which promised um, Ukraine and Georgia NATO membership, but didn't say when and how this would happen. So the, um, the argument here is not so much that it is a national interest of Ukraine or not only that it is a national, core national interest of Ukraine to become a member of the European Union, especially of the European Union, but the argument is here rather that especially the aim of membership of the European Union is not something that is new to Ukraine, is not something that has come up with the Orange Revolution or with the Euromaidan, but it has been part of uh, the entire post-Soviet history of Ukraine and in fact it begins already when Ukraine was still a, was still a member of the uh, 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 part of the Soviet Union. And so the argument here is rather that this would be discarding not only the interests of Ukraine but also of the contemporary history of Ukraine and would uh, as it would uh, be in, in contradiction not only to the recent demands from the Euromaidan but um, in fact to the to all of the political, uh, um, uh, major political forces in, in Ukraine. In fact, you could argue there was within East Central Europe, the East Central European context, nothing special about Kyiv's various statements, appeals, and policies towards Euro-Atlantic integration after 1990. Most of the countries in the region were often even more vehemently than Kiev pursuing similar aims. Whereas Dembinsky and Spanger allege in their article in which they outline uh, the, the rationale of their, um, of their proposal that, quote, the, the West insisted on the enlargement of the Western security organization, organizations, in German, der Westen pochte angeblich of the Ausdehnung der westlichen Sicherheitsorganisation. The real story was in fact a different one. The EU and NATO were both at first reluctant to open their doors to the ever more loudly knocking East Europeans, leading some of them temporarily to plan for an alternative security structure. A project that was may, many of you, of you may not know that became known in the early 1990s as NATO BIS. This was, that was an idea in Eastern Europe then for an East European security organization that was developed then, uh, especially in Poland, against the uh, background that th at that point um, the uh, NATO was not yet ready to provide a membership perspective, for instance, to Poland. Eventually, however, the two major organizations of the West, the EU and NATO, agreed to let some of uh, these East European nations uh, in and, give them, and to give them membership perspectives. This happened, however, only after considerable, considerable begging, complaining, casualing, lobbying by the diplomats, politicians, emigres, intellectuals, and so on, and others of the various East Central European countries um, in the West. Unfortunately, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia were, however, not among those countries lucky enough to get roadmaps towards memberships, membership in the two cherished Western organizations. Unlike their more successful East Central uh, European Slavic brother nations, for instance, who had obtained a membership perspective in the 1990s and have gradually acceded to the EU since 2004, the Ukrainians have so far been left out in the cold and have so far not been officially promised a future membership um, in the EU and have received from NATO only uh, a somewhat unclear uh, membership uh, promise. Instead of full integration into uh, the European Union, they have instead been offered by Brussels an association with the European Union. To the surprise of many, even this half-hearted offer by the EU was sufficient enough to let the Ukrainians start in late 2013 uh, what eventually would become a full-scale revolution that was fought under the European flag 
and came to be known under the name Yevromaidan, Euromaidan, European Square. The signing and ratification of the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement in summer 2014 is understood by most Ukrainians as their country's first step towards attaining full membership in the European Union. In contrast, many Western politicians, diplomats and experts do currently not share this assumption or even see this hopeful Ukrainian interpretation of the Association Agreement as an idle dream. The popular Ukrainian vision of an association leading to eventual integration into the EU may, in view of the peculiar depth, comprehensiveness, and mechanisms of the EU's 2014 mammoth agreement with Ukraine, be, however, not without foundation. In fact, this, U this Ukrainian understanding of the association agree agreement may be closer to the future course, I would say, of events than the currently often dismissive approach to the prospects of a Ukrainian EU membership, even among seasoned political analysts like Dembinsky and Spanger. Once and when the association agreement is fully implemented, Ukraine will already have largely become, uh, become a part of the EU's normative and legal sphere. sphere. The, the issue here simply being that, in fact, the name association agreement is, I would say, a misnomer for the agreements that, um, uh, that uh, the EU has uh, signed with Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, because these are far larger association agreements than the other association agreements uh, that the EU has with many countries around the world. The remaining, so those, when these association agreements in these two, three countries are implemented, the remaining final step towards full membership uh, will then be a relatively small one. While the texts of Georgia's, Moldova's, and Ukraine's association agreements, agreements do not say that they prepare these countries for accession to the Union, de facto, these three exceptional treaties do exactly that. While Dembinsky and Spanger, these two German authors, appear in the texts as political pragmatists, they leave unclear how one and who exactly could undo these and a number of other aspects of Ukraine's stance towards the European integration and of uh, arguably already Ukraine's start towards European integration and to the entire relations of Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova to the EU during the coming years. That is in spite of the fact that achieving an agreement on Ukraine's neutrality would be crucial to Spangers and Dubinsky's um, uh, proposal. So while they, while they say the, the EU should simply deny officially membership to Ukraine, future membership, um, to, to the European Union, they say not, they do not say how that can be actually done, in fact, of all the, in, in view of all the facts that I have, I have listed uh, before. Without, however, a permanent exclusion of Ukraine from the EU and NATO, the arguably anyway ephemeral bargain with Russia that, that Dembinsky and Spanger envisage would have no chance whatsoever. Moreover, the two authors wrongly assert in their, in their uh, article, but that is maybe just a side, uh, a side um, uh, argument here, uh, that a European Council decision of December 2016 allegedly excluded a future EU membership for Ukraine, um, while in fact this, there was a Council, European Council de decision, but this document merely said that the association, association agreement does not imply a future accession which is itself, is, I would say, semi-ridiculous statement as it loudly reasserts a well-known feature of the association agreement. So, they, so the, 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 the bizarre thing that happened in uh, December 2016 that in response to a referendum that was conducted, you may have heard about it, um, in the Netherlands about uh, the association agreement between the EU and Ukraine, where a majority who took part in this Dutch referendum rejected the association agreement. The European Council then, in December 2016, um, has to react to this referendum in the, in the Netherlands and 
and largely oddly, this, this European Council document says about the association agreements things or denies certain things to Ukraine that were not in the association agreement. So the association agreement did not have a membership perspective. And then the European Council document that was adopted in response to this, um, to this referendum in, in the Netherlands says that the association agreement does not provide a membership perspective, but it never did. So this is the ridiculous part about it. Seen from, from Kiev, as I would think, Dubinsky and Spanger, as well as many other Western authors with little regional expertise, sound like writing about Ukrainian affairs from a parallel world. The naivete about Ukraine's history, politics, and foreign affairs that emerges from their text has, I suspect, much to do with the scarcity of academic Ukrainian studies in Germany and of permanent German correspondents in, uh, in Kiev, not to mention other Ukrainian cities. That is, by the way, also something that I think sometimes is not well understood, that much of the sort of unpleasant things one can hear about Ukraine in the Western press and from Western politicians and, and sometimes even diplomats, they have a lot to do um, not so much with, with, with Russian dis disinformation, but simply with the lack of expertise on, on Ukraine and lack of information on Ukraine. And therefore, sometimes I think there is also a too, a too aggressive, uh, as I at least observe, a too aggressive of some Ukrainians' um, um, reaction to mistakes that are made in Western reporting, in Western assessments, in Western, ju Western judgments about Ukraine. So often that is seen then that these people are somehow under the spell of Russian propaganda, but often, and that is at least my, my suspicion, um, the, the story is a much simpler one that um, academic um, Ukrainian studies and, uh, and uh, journalism on Ukraine and political expertise on Ukraine is just missing and this then uh, allows for, uh, leads to these to these misjudgments. The, sh the shortage of deep analytical knowledge and properly contextualized narratives about Ukraine is one reason for the uh, receptiveness of, for instance, German media, politics, and elites, including even academics to Russian crypto-imperial in uh, interpretations, regular misinformation, and outright defamation with regard to Ukraine's, for instance, minority policies, contemporary history, popular opinion, right-wing extremism, conduct of war, political regime, cultural affairs, language situation, etc. Now to the second issue, Ukraine's regional experience, and by regional ex experience I mean here, what can Ukraine, or what have Ukraines learned from the East European region about Russian behavior towards this region? East Central Europe and the so Southern Caucasus. Not only do Dembinski and Spanger, these two German authors, ignore when making their proposal to neutralize Ukraine, impor um, ignore important facts about Ukraine's identity and Kiev's relations to Brussels. From a Ukrainian perspective, uh, as, as I see it at least, and against the more general background of the experiences of the various post-Soviet states with Russian neo-imperialism since 1991, they also grossly miscalculate the chances for the achievement and sustainability of a stable plural peace in Eastern Europe. When they propose to dissociate, dissociation is one of the major concepts they, that they introduce, dissociation, and by that they mean they want to keep things apart. They want to deal with the issue of peace, and leave the issue of Crimea out. They don't want to link the issue of Crimea and the issue of, of peace. And that is their, their idea that in order to achieve peace, you have to leave the principle of pol political sovereignty and territorial integrity out. And you have to dissociate the aim of achieving peace from the aim of uh, reestablishing the territorial, territorial integrity and political sovereignty of, of Ukraine. 
when they do is propose to dissociate various policy issues between the West and Russia, and this concerns not only the example that of Crimea that I've just mentioned, they ignore the course and results of similar previous Western, not the least German attempts to come to a rapprochement with Vladimir Putin via a purposeful compartmentalization of an ad hoc exclusion of difficult issues from Western Russian relations. For instance, in 2001, the German government invited Putin to give a, give a speech to the Bundestag. Russia's new German-speaking president was greeted, greeted with standing ovations by the majority of German MPs after this speech. Unfortunately, however, that happened at a point in time when Russia had still troops stationed in the Moldovan separatist region of Transnistria. There were no credible signals from Moscow in 2001 when Putin was invited to the Bundestag, the German parliament, that the Kremlin intends to fulfill its two signed agreements, a bilateral Russian-Moldovan one from 1994 and the OSCE document, a document of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe from 1999, about the withdrawal of Russian troops from Moldovan state territory from the Transnistrian region. As a result of lacking Western pressure and the EU's accommodative approach to the Kremlin, this Russian armed unit, or um, a smaller part of it, remains until today illegally on Moldova's territory, and Moscow continues to support Transnistrian separatism to date. Worse, Berlin employed the same unsuccessful accommodative and dissociating approach seven years later. At the 8th St. Petersburg Dialogue, with, with, which is a scheme of uh, 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 cooperation between Germany and Russia, the 8th eight, meeting of the so-called St. Petersburg Dialogue, in October 2008, Germany announced officially a modernization partnership between Germany and Russia, a formula later also employed by the EU and most of the member states of the EU for their cooperation in economic and scientific affairs with Moscow. That was done, although at that time, in October 2008, not only were Russian troops still in Moldova, in spite of Russia's earlier obligations and, and signed agreement uh, to withdraw its troops from Transnistria, it had also already become clear in October 2008 that the Kremlin was not inclined to, to fulfill the so-called Sarkozy plan. That means the August 2008 peace treaty between Russia and Georgia after the short five-day Russian-Georgian war in August 2008. In this agreement named Sarkozy plan because it was uh, negotiated by Nicolas Sarkozy who was then uh, French uh, the president and, uh, the, and France had the presidency uh, uh, in the European Union and was loose, um, an uh, agreement that was uh, um, sort of promoted by the European Union between Georgia and Russia. In this agreement, Russian-Georgian peace agreement from, from August 2008, Moscow had committed itself to, among others, withdrawing its troops from Georgia's separatist territories South Ossetia and Abkhazia. As the minor Western sanctions in reaction to West Moscow's invasion of Georgia were soon cancelled, and Berlin and as well as Washington started their reset policies towards Russia, the Kremlin saw no reason to fulfill the obligations it had just taken upon itself in writing. Those Russian troops are today still illegally stationed on Georgian state territory although there is a signed agreement between Georgia and Russia about the Russian withdrawal of the troops from Georgian state territory. These and other German and further Western attempts to come to an accommodation and build a partnership with Putin's Russia in defiance of international law and historical experience did not only fail to result in any substantive softening of the Kremlin's approach to either Moldova or Georgia, the timid temporary or absent EU and US reactions to Russia's violations 
or various agreements that the Kremlin had itself negotiated and officially signed, and especially Germany's manifest courting of Putin, were an in indirect encouragement for, and I would say a direct prelude to the Kremlin's behavior in Ukraine since 2014. They accompanied, previewed, and made possible Put Putin's demonstrative non-fulfillment of such important multilateral documents as the December 1994 Budapest Memorandum. I will say more about this. You may have heard this, this, uh, um, about this Budapest Memorandum before. I will, I will later explain what it is. The no already mentioned 1999 OSCE document in which Russia had committed itself to withdrawing um, its troops from Transnistria. The mentioned August 2008 Sarkozy plan or the April 2014 Geneva Statement um, uh, Declaration um, of the US, EU, Russia, and, um, and Ukraine. The set September 2014 Minsk Protocol and Memorandum negotiated um, together with France and Germany uh, between Russia and Ukraine, as well as the February 2015 Minsk Agreement, the so-called Minsk II Agreement. The most il il illustri uh, instructive illustration, in my view, however, for the chances of achieving the type of stable, accommodating plural peace with Russia's current leadership that Dubinsky and Spanger propose is perhaps the development of Armenia's relations to the EU and Russia in 2013. Since July 2010, Yerevan had been negotiating its own association agreement with the EU similar to those of Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova that were signed in 2014. Armenia from 2010 to 2013 was successfully adapting its legislation to EU standards as documented by the country's impressive performance in the yearly European Integration Index for Eastern Partnership countries which, which is a sort of um, methodology to, to measure the, uh, the adoption by the Eastern Partnership. The Eastern Partnership is a, is a program, a neighborhood program of the EU with six uh, East European countries, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, um, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And in this index of adopting <laughs> EU regulations, Armenia was doing quite well in 2010, 2013 and was negotiating its own association agreement uh, as, the, as Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine uh, with the EU. However, on 3rd of this, uh, September 2013, the presidents of Russia and Armenia spoke in a closed meeting at Novo Ogaryova, after which Serge Sarksyan, the Armenian president, announced that Armenia would join the customs Union and the Eurasian U Economic Union. And that implied that there will be no proper Armenian association agreement, including a free trade zone with the EU, because Armenia, if it would enter the customs union as it did then, and the Eurasian Economic Union could not would not be able to negotiate such a um, uh, free trade zone with the EU. What I think is remarkable about the Armenian example is that Yerevan was then, still is, and will remain for the foreseeable future tightly bound to Moscow in whatever um, um, scenario. And be firmly, be, an Armenia will be firmly located in Russia's sphere of influence independently of whether it is associated with the EU or not. Not only is Armenia a member of Moscow's, or it was then already, of Moscow's collective security treaty organization, or the KB is the uh, Russian um, um, abbreviation, it's also can, called the Tashkent Pact, and thus Armenia is legally part of a Kremlin-dominated security zone. Because of its territorial claim to Azerbaijan's Nagorno-Karabakh region, Yerevan is also substantive, substantively reliant on Russian troops and support. Otherwise, the militarily superior Azeri army could and probably would quickly reconquer Nagorno-Karabakh. This means 
that even if Armenia had signed the association agreement with the EU as it clearly intended to until 2013, it would have remained highly dependent on, cl closely tied to, and under the direct influence of Russia because of, the, of this, basically because of the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, influence and, and Russia's support for Armenia in this uh, confrontation with, Az uh, with Azerbaijan. The lesson, I think, of the Armenian case is that Russia's rulers think less in terms of spheres of influence in a narrow sense than in categories of domestic regime stability and narrow clan interests to which a potentially successful Armenian economic and political association with the EU could become a threat. The annexation of Crimea, covert intervention in the Donetsk Basin, and subsequent international isolation of Russia may not make much sense from a viewpoint of Russia's medium and long-term strategic national interests because it imp implies a whole array of, of various costs. They have, for instance, weakened Russia's position vis-a-vis -vis China, undermined West Western Russian cooperation against terrorism, and alienated Moscow's major modernization partner, the European Union. Yet, Putin's behavior makes fully sense in terms of the short-term stability of his kleptocratic regime and as an instrument to divide um, uh, and, uh, and as an instrument to divide the Russian opposition, for instance, with the help of the Crimea issue. And, and I think the Armenian example also illustrates that this is very much about Russian domestic affairs and, and not so much about um, um, uh, some ideological prescription. Pragmatism and goal orientation in Western approaches to Russia should take into account these and similar historical experiences from post-Soviet international relations, especially since the beginning of Putin's rule in 1999. A supposedly non-moralistic and practic uh, practical approach to securing peace in Eastern Europe has to be founded on relevant empirical evidence and cannot be simply deducted from some general assumptions about how geopolitics is supposed to work and that the geopolitics is supposed to reflect the long-term or medium-term national interests of nations. Such prescriptions may, in view of the frustrating lessons of the last 25 years, not impress many East European security experts and run the risk of causing hidden delight and even amusement in Moscow. The Kremlin may be happy to sign as many as necessary additional international agreements in exchange for Western concessions, such as a permanent exclusion of Ukraine from the EU and NATO, yet Moscow may later find once more weighty excuses like fascism, genocide, concentration camps, etc., in Kiev, in Astana, in Tbilisi, etc., to ignore these new legal obligations like the old one, as blatantly as it did with regard to the various older written and by and multilateral agreements it, had, uh, it has negotiated, formulated, signed, and partly even ratified during the last quarter of a century. And now finally to, to my third and, and final point, the link between Ukrainian territorial integrity and the international regime for the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. What is most striking in the um, uh, in Dembinsky's and Spanger's assessment as peace uh, as coming from a, uh, from a foundation that is devoted to peace and conflict studies that's the name of the foundation uh, they um, uh, where they are work is their silence in this article on the meaning and consequences of Ukraine's post-Soviet accession to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty NPT and the related well-known memorandum on security assurances for Ukraine, as well as of similar documents for Belarus and Kazakhstan at the December 1994 CSCE summit at Budapest. CSCE, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, was the predecessor of the OSCD. To be sure, this Budapest memorandum is not a treaty. It has thus not been ratified by the four signatory states, the US, Russia, Great Britain, and Ukraine. Although it is, it is not a proper contract under international law, 
the Bu Budapest Memorandum signed in December 1994 between these four countries, countries has nevertheless a rather high importance for world security, if not human survival. That is because it linked Ukraine's territorial integrity and political sovereignty to the international regime that prevents the spread of atom atomic weapons. The connection of these two seem seemingly unrelated issues was signaled by the signature of Great Britain under the Budapest Memorandum, although London had somewhat oddly not been part of the preceding trilateral negotiations, negotiation process between the US, Russia and Ukraine. And this nego negotiation was, of course, about the uh, withdrawal of nuclear weapons from Ukraine's territory after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Although Westminster was a secondary actor in early post-Soviet international relations, London was asked to sign the Budapest Memorandum too, because the UK is, apart from the US and Russia, one of the so-called three depositary states of the non-proliferation uh, non treaty. And depositary state means that these three countries, the UK, the US, and the, the Soviet Union, and then, then Russia as the legal successor of the Soviet Union, are the sort of founders and the guarantors of the non-proliferation regime. They deposit this treaty. They are the depositary states. Great Britain's signature under the Budapest Memorandum, which, uh, which guaranteed or which assured um, Ukraine of its territorial integrity and political sovereignty, was meant to signify to the world that this document, although it is not a treaty by itself, gives security assurances that are linked to the non global non-proliferation regime. So Britain was played here such a large symbolic role because it is one of the depositary states of the non-proliferation treaty and signed the memorandum, although it had not been uh, part of the negotiations um, of the, that led to the um, uh, memorandum. As is well known, Ukraine inherited after the breakup of the USSR in 1991, a large stockpile of Soviet atomic weapons, including an arsenal of various nuclear warheads that was far larger than the weapons of mass destruction arsenals of China, France, Great Britain taken together. While most of these weapons were unusable for Ukraine, this enormous amount of atomic arms and Ukraine's formidable military industri industrial complex as well as scientific expertise would have been sufficient for Ukraine to create a small nuclear deterrent force. However, Ukraine declared for a number of reasons, among them uh, the uh, Chernobyl disaster of 1986, to become a fully non-nuclear state, not only to get rid, rid of a part of its uh, weapons, um, as already had in fact happened in early two, uh, 1992, uh, but to, to get rid of all of its nuclear warheads and of all facilities also uh, related to them, and to enter the non-proliferation treaty in, a, in the capacity of a non-nuclear state and to rely on the security assurances it had been given in the related Budapest Memorandum as well as in two separate governmental statements by China and France as the two remaining official nuclear states under the non-proliferation treaty. While Russia had several times before 2014 de facto violated the Budapest Memorandum because it exerted uh, economic pressure, for instance, uh, on, uh, on Ukraine that was, uh, that was explicitly uh, forbidden in the Budapest Memorandum. Moscow has been denouncing the Budapest Memorandum altogether and quite demonstratively through its far-going actions on Crimea and in the Donbass Basin since February 2014. Ever since, the logic of the non-proliferation regime has been fatally damaged and even turned on its head. Russia has not only officially annexed a part of Ukraine and unofficially occupied another part, both by military means, Moscow has, has used its officially enshrined, enshrined nuclear status under the non-proliferation treaty, which gives Russia the right to have nuclear weapons. Russia has used these nuclear weapons 
to shelter its covert invasions from external resistance to these invasions of Ukraine, as demonstrated by the glaring contrast between the West's military activities in the Middle East, on the one side, and the inactivity of the West in the former Soviet space, on the other. Moscow has done so, moreover, through a military aggression against a former nuclear power that had voluntarily agreed to hand over its large atomic weapons arsenal to Russia. Oddly, Ukraine's faithfulness to the non-proliferation idea has costed two prime parts of its territory, Crimea and, par and uh, a part of the Donetsk Basin, whereas Russia's special status as a nuclear power under the non-proliferation treaty has helped it get to get and to secure these two territories. Such effects were clearly not behind the idea of the non-proliferation treaty. Ukraine's fate is not only sad by itself, but may thus also make other state leaders around the world wonder why and whether they should support the preser preservation of, human, of, of the humanities um, non-proliferation regime. Dembinsky and Spanger, to be sure, seem to, be give, give, seem to give international law its due by proposing to make uh, permanent those Western anti-Russian sanctions that were adopted in reaction to Russia's annexation of Crimea. At least that they acknowledge that this uh, has to be punished uh, further on, even, even um, um, besides, even if there is a grand bargain with, with Moscow. However, the Crimea-related sanctions have not only have only limited range, they mainly concern Crimea itself. They have a symbolic meaning and they have small practical consequences for, the, for Russia in its entirety. Arguably, these characteristics of their introduction in spring 2014, namely the weakness of these Crimea-related sanctions, actually encouraged Russia to continue its intervention in mainland Ukraine after it had successfully annexed the peninsula, the Crimean Peninsula, rather than, um, and, uh, and has not been efficaciously punished for it by the West. The unlimited prolongation of the Crimea-related sanctions does make sense, I would say, yet it will by itself be only a minor concession to the rule of international law. Instead, the Binskys and Spangers proposed parallel measures to officially and permanently exclude the possibility of Ukraine's accession to the EU and NATO is a more consequential part of their plan as it would send far -going a far-going international signal by thereby res sort of respecting Moscow's rather than Kiev's wishes with regard to Ukraine's geopolitical future, the West would publicly gratify the Kremlin for its foreign aggression implicit and implicitly denounced the Budapest, Budapest Memorandum and thereby indirectly undermine the legal, political and psychological foundations of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Moscow and the West would thereby jointly demonstrate to the world that military aggression, nuclear threatening and public warmongering are useful instruments to achieve one's foreign policy goals. The conclusion for various current and future politicians around the entire world could be that their countries need to get the bomb themselves, lest they are ready to run the risk to become subject to deals similar to the one proposed by Dembinsky and Spanger with regard to Ukraine, namely that they lose their political sovereignty. My conclusions from that. Unfortunately, the chances for a just and sustainable bargain with Russia, Russia's current leadership are slim. Unless one is ready to undermine the normative, political, and legal foundations on which such international institutions and the, as the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization are built. Such a dubious deal could perhaps create some short-term relief. It could create the impression that some sort of peace, plural peace, has been achieved. Yet it would do substantial damage to international law and, geo and the geopolitical balance with new subsequent risks currently difficult to foresee. 
Russia may see its partnership, partnership in such a deal as equally inconsequential as its earlier signatures under the various Budapest, Istanbul, Geneva, or Minsk uh, documents mentioned above. By, by the Ista Istanbul uh, document, I mean the OSCE document of 1999, in which uh, Russia um, promised to withdraw its troops from Transnistria. As frustrating as that may be, it is necessary to acknowledge that there is currently no sustainable, quick solution to the Russian-Western conflict or tensions without a substantive change of foreign political preferences or perhaps even a domestic, a domestic political regime change in Moscow. One should, if one is really pragmatic and realistic, as Dembinsky and Spanger claim to be, one should do is frankly acknowledge that as long as the Kremlin's prerogatives are as, th are as they are currently, the only really, as Dembinsky and Spanger seem to prefer, pragmatic approach to deal with the so-called Ukraine crisis is to muddle through, as good as that is possible under difficult conditions. As many as possible baby steps rather than the one ground bargain envisaged by Dembinsky and Spanger as well as, well as many other observers, are the tasks of the day, in my opinion. Daydreaming about some magical deal with Putin merely functions as a distraction from solving other, admittedly smaller, yet more consequential issues, such as strengthening the Ukrainian state, preserving Western uni unity vis-a-vis -vis Russia, more actively communicating with Russian civil society, engaging diplomatically with the entire post-Soviet state, space and so, um, and so on. And I could uh, talk if, you, if you're interested more about these sort of baby steps uh, that uh, could be taken to improve the situation. It is, I think, the very pragmatism and the um, aim of achieving a more peaceful world that Dembinsky and Spanger so loudly promote. And I think they truly believe in that. It's not just sort of uh, a show, which leads me to doubt the usefulness of their plan and similar proposals to come to some sort of larger accommodation with the current Russian regime. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the women here, first of all, for helping raise the Ukrainian culture because without them, there would be very little of those traditions and language left. So, I support yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You developed the, uh, the thought of that a modicum of peace for you, Ukraine is vital and important. Uh, liberal. Uh, the liberal peace being the rights of nations and law versus the plural peace being unequal nations but also other bargains so that it's liberal plus. So my question to you is that if, uh, if the two maxims that I believe in that uh, I've heard is that peace is, that, uh, is not the absence of war but the presence of justice and the other maxim is that peace is that which is known at the other side of war. Germany being the, the, the second one once more is peace is that which is known on the other side of war. So you can only know peace after you've had yes. war. Okay. okay. Otherwise, it's understood. You, you yes. don't you don't suffer. There's yes. no suffering. Such. So Germany being a republic means that it is a democracy plus inalienable rights. There's additions to what a democracy is. And that would mean that a simple majority does not rule, cannot overrule those inalienable <coughs> rights. So my question is, why if Germany is a republic, are the Germans so involved in trying to make this a plural peace or accept a bargain for the sake of peace alone, without the fact that Ukraine lost territory, that this could happen again at some future point. 
What is your thought on the fact that Ukraine would just accept peace for the modicum of time that it would allow that peace? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, um, in a way, I've, I think I've indicated this. The, the, the idea here is just that the, I mean, if you put it in, 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 in very simple terms, it's, it's, it's simple fear. Fear of, of an escalation of the current tensions between Russia and the West. And, the, and that is also, I think, if Dubinsky and Spanger would be stay, uh, saying here, they would probably say something similar. That the, that the threat of a World War III, of a nuclear escalation, is just so, so imperative that you, you cannot sort of, you have to, you make, to make these compromises. And they would, I think they would be very clearly say that we, we know that this is, that this is a, 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 a treason of, with regard to principles of the West. That this, this is treacherous to core principles that the West um, proclaims and that implementing such a plural peace would amount to applying double standards. That Ukraine would have fewer rights than, for instance, Germany. And they would say that, and they would admit that this is morally questionable. But they would say that it is so important to get to this condominium or accommodation with, with Russia, and they would even perhaps say, in the interest also of Ukraine, that we should, we should make these concessions. This, and they would call that then, of course, realism. You know, we have to be realists. Well, you know, so liberal principles are nice, but you know, we have to. That, I think that was, would be their their approach. I don't. You, I mean, there are some people who have this sort of, you know, this, who have an absurd vision of Russia that you know, Russia is misunderstood and NATO allegedly promised not to expand and the West um, sort of was disrespectful to Russia and that is why all that. This is one part of people. I don't think they belong to this to this group. I also don't think they belong to the um, to the. They are not cor that they are corrupted. You're They're, talking about the Binsky. Yeah, these these analysts. I would give them credit. You know, this these credits. I would give them. It's they they would understand themselves that they are just logical thinkers about international relations, and they deduct from the imperative of pre preserving the world from a nuclear escalation. They they make these deductions and they see this as a logical outflow of this absolute imperative of preventing World War III. That would be, I think, their answer. So one of the things that the war in Eastern Ukraine has had is the world now knows where Ukraine is, those people that care and knows about Ukraine and Ukrainians that really under the Soviet Union was sort of nebulous at best. So there's been some advantage. But uh, just one more short point is that um, in an uh, Economist uh, article in May of 2012, there was a poll done in Europe about who the hardest working Europeans were. And all the Europeans stated that Germans were, except the Greeks that said the Greeks were the hardest working. <laughs> and given that point, my, uh, given that Germany is the hardest working, has the hardest working populace, Given the, the according to the, to the work hours, there are also statistics of work hours and Germany has actually very few work Maybe hours. the quality is there though. So my question is that Germany is financing Greece and Germans are the hardest working given a poll and they, they're the banker of Europe and yet they complain that they don't get their money back. So if I had a banker that never got his money back, I don't know how much I'd want him to be my negotiator. That's my point. Thank you. I mean, I've, I've criticized Germany here a lot, but one, had, one has to also acknowledge, and that is maybe difficult to see from Canada, that within the context of the European Union, in the last four years, Germany, mm -hmm. oddly enough, if you look at, at, the, at the earlier times, has become, within the context of other European nations, uh, in the European Union, a hawk to, uh, in, with regard to Russia. And Germany is every half, every half year is pushing through the next sanctions round. This is the, 
the odd thing about, you know, this is, so my critique is actually, and that's what I, that's why I mentioned this sort of role of, uh, of lacking academic studies on Ukraine, lacking correspondence in Kiev and so on, that lots of these miscalculations, they have just, they have a lot to do with lacking knowledge simply about the region and sort of naive, naive uh, rather than wrong uh, views of the, um, of the region, I would say. I have a question. I haven't heard anything mentioned about how uh, President Poroshenko is responding to this or any of the Ukrainian leadership. Well, I think that uh, I haven't mentioned it because, because it's to me crystal clear that this is, of, of course, rejected by, by all major... I mean, there, there have been... Uh, there, there was a famous article by Viktor Pinchuk in, in the Wall Street Journal where he proposed something similar, yeah, but there was immediate, a very, a very strong reaction of, of Ukrainian civil society, of politicians, against this idea of having a bargain with Russia. I see this as just a, a capitulation to Russia. Slowly, they're trying to get to the pre-1991 uh, regime. Yeah, well, a capitulation is maybe, a, I would say, a too st strong word. Uh, my, my colleague, um, at, the, uh, at my institute, for Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation, he has responded to the uh, Pinchuk proposal by saying, yes, at the end of the day, we have to make a deal with Russia, but this is not the time for it. We have to wait for a moment when we can make a deal with Russia that we can accept, that, this that will, we may also have to make compromises, but the time will have to come where we can actually where these compromises were, will be so minor that we can do them. I mean, you know, the, the geography remains, of course, and Ukraine and, and Russia at the end of the day, and that's indeed in the interest, and there's actually a sort of uh, a certain convergence between Dembinsky and Spanger and, and you know, Al Alexander Sushko, whom I'm, I'm just uh, quoting here, you know, he cannot be suspected of any sort of pro-Russian um, uh, pro pro um, uh, inclinations that, that you have to come to some accommodation with Russia, but, but, but with this regime, you know, I mean, hope always dies at last. I mean, I would hope maybe that there is some, after the elections, re-election of, uh, if you call it elections of, of Putin, maybe, maybe he, he changes his mind or, or something, or maybe there will be a new, a new leader, or maybe there will be a new regime, or, or maybe there will be even a revolution or something like that. But you have to wait for this moment. You cannot do it before, before you have a, a significant foreign policy preference change in Moscow. Once that, that happened, then you have to go to the negotiation table. And then you can also take Dembinsky and Spanger with you and, and have them as, as, as uh, advisors maybe at such negotiations. Um, hello. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you. I enjoyed your, your talk. I thought it was very good, very detailed, and I especially liked your conclusions about baby steps. I think that's a very good point. However, while listening to you throughout the lecture, um, I was thinking about a conversation that I had last summer in a park here in Canada with somebody from Russia whom I met by chance. And uh, we compared our experiences. I visited the Soviet Union under the, in the old days, 1981 to be exact. And I described to him the kind of censorship and uh, secret police influence that I felt during the entire time I was there. Practically everybody that I talked to was KGB. Practically everybody. Except uh, the professors at the university. And you could tell they were not KGB because they were always afraid. They were always afraid to say too much. They were afraid to invite us to our homes, that type of thing. This gentleman told me that this doesn't exist in Russia anymore. There is not that all-pervasive fear. There is some fear, but not that all-pervasive fear that once existed. And he said he didn't like the regime, he didn't like Putin, and he was searching for a word to describe that regime. Now, something that you said jives what I suggested to him. I suggested a word. You mentioned at one point narrow clan influences, if I correct it, correctly quote you. My word was mafia. And he said, that's it. 
That's, that's this regime. It's a mafia regime. So my question to you is, how do you make peace with a mafia who does not keep its word, with a mafia who does not believe in law, um, and a, a mafia that is willing to uh, go to all kinds of extremes? How do you make peace with the mafia? I, I like your idea of baby steps, um, but I'm just begging the question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've just used that term here, baby steps, as a sort of, as a mirror of this grand bargain, you know, to, 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 to express that there is no, no big solution, you know. And the, uh, eventually the only real full solution in, is indeed some sort of, would be some sort of deal, but, the, but it's just not there right now. Um, I mean, there's another paper I have I've just pre presented that actually at, at Harvard, where, where I talk about not only about the sort of baby steps like um, supporting Ukraine and and um, and you know and and upholding the sanctions regime and communicating with, with Russian civil society, but also about um, creating alliances between Ukraine and other countries. And uh, there's another paper where I discuss. What are the chances for NATO membership for Ukraine? What are the chances for EU membership? And, and two other things that um, are maybe not enough discussed are um, the so-called major non-NATO ally status, which is a scheme that the US has for friendly nations around the world and in, within which the US provides special support and maybe even a pact to, to nations around the uh, world to non-NATO members, uh, uh, nations. And the, the sort of the prototypical for that is the South Korean US uh, Treaty of 1953. And my hope, and that was what I began with, is that the current tensions may be between the US and Russia, they may, they may actually lead to this idea perhaps coming up again with regard to Ukraine. It was already in the air in 2014 um, until December 2014, there was um, 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 a draft law for the so-called Ukraine Freedom Support Act in which the major non-NATO ally status for Ukraine was in this draft included. And then at the 11th hour, if shortly before the treaty, before the law was adopted by Congress, this was kicked out, unfortunately. But maybe there's now a chance when, when, you know, because the U.S. is now, Washington is so much focused on Russia, maybe they will actually, that is my hope. And as I said, I cannot academically express this hope so far. It's, it's more like a, like a feeling that perhaps this could then lead to, to such a step. The other alliance, which is I think the most obvious one, is the so-called intermarium, an alliance with the, with, between the East, East Central European nations. All those, na those nations from Estonia in the, in the north, maybe even Finland, but especially the post-Soviet nations, Estonia to Georgia in, in the south, that have a, a similar perception of a Russian threat. And that in includes not only uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, but also the, the three Baltic states, Poland, Romania, and also certain circles, at least in, in Bulgaria, in Slovakia, um, that, that have all also more critical view. Uh, and that would be the more, most natural alliance uh, because these are the countries that are neighbors. They have similar historical experiences with Russia. They have um, similar threat perceptions. But for a number of reasons, unfortunately, that is also not, not yet discussed. But this, these, are, these are ways how you can perhaps get to peace with the mafia, as you said. You, know, you, have, to you have to present a counterforce. You have to threaten the mafia. You have to say, you know, if you, if you come here again, you'll have to pay a price. And you have to create this perception in, in Moscow that the price will be higher than it is now. That is the way to, to deal with the mafia, I would say. And, uh, so I just want to take uh, this opportunity to thank Andreas Umland for uh, just a brilliant talk. Um, really riveting. I, I just, uh, I, I was hanging off the end, edge of my seat. Uh, and uh, it's given me a lot, and I'm sure it's given the audience a lot to uh, think about. 
So um, uh, join me in thanking our 25th anniversary J.B. Rudnitsky Distinguished Lecturer.